J.K. Simmons, Al Pacino, but to talk to a producer, that's, yeah. gotta, that's gotta be interesting. That's yeah, we have really, uh, really some insight about how things are done in the industry. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm psyched. It'll be nice to get the producer side of it. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to this event. I'm excited to hear Stephanie speak tonight. Hi everybody, I'm Lydia Cedroni. I am the head of feature productions here at NIFA and the former chair of producing, so it's especially excellent for me to be here tonight. Tonight's Q&A is moderated by producer Tova Later and myself. Tova's credits include Glory with Denzel Washington, Oliver Stone's Nixon, Evita with Antonio Banderas and Madonna, and Varsity Blues. Our guest tonight is Stephanie Elaine. As Senior Vice President of Columbia Pictures, Stephanie has helped launch the careers of filmmakers Robert Rodriguez and John Singleton, shepherding Singleton's Boys in the Hood to two Academy Award nominations. Following her tenure at Columbia Pictures, she served as President at Jim Henson Productions. Under her Homegrown Pictures banner, she produced Craig Brewster's Hustle and Flow, which earned the Audience Award at Sundance, the Academy Award for Best Original Song, and a Best Actor nomination for Terrence Howard. Understandably. After watching it tonight, right? She's produced the directorial debut films of Sinea Hamry and of Tina Gordon Chisholm. And she's worked again with Craig Brewer, producing his film Black Snake Moan. Stephanie produced Tim Story's Hurricane Season, and most recently, Gina Prince Blythewood's Blackbird, and Justin Simeon's directorial debut, Dear White People. In addition to her most prolific producing endeavors, Stephanie is director of the Los Angeles Film Festival, producer of the Spirit Awards, a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, and of the Producers Guild of America, and she sits on the board of Women in Film. It's my pleasure to introduce her this evening, so please join us in welcoming Stephanie Elaine. Hi, everybody. Hello. Okay, so what did we think about this movie? <laughs> well, unbelievable. Ten years later, and this is sizzling, sizzling, sizzling hot. And by the way, yeah. I was at that screening in Sundance. Mm. I Good. snuck in with Ruth Vitali and yep. Dinner Steen. Yeah, yeah. And it was like, I couldn't believe. And then, you know, we stood in the lobby and they were like trying to say, and you know, and maybe we can bring MTV. And I just did a movie with MTV. And I said, yeah, you know. Anyway, it was a very special. It was special a night. very, very special. It night. was the kind of night that everything that we'd worked for and thought about, because this movie took a really, really long time to get together, find the money, and eventually produce it. And everyone who had turned us down was in the room that night. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone who turned us down wanted it. So it was, it was pretty special. You know, before I even get to the movie, I want to ask you a question because I was thinking about it today. Because you and I grew up in the studio system. Mm -hmm. And then you go and you make this switch to independent filmmaking at a time when we didn't even register it. You know, and so how did that switch happen? Because the studio system and, you know, the development of it and the thing, and so the independent, it's just two different sensibilities. Well, I think it was really by necessity because the kind of movies, we had gone through an era in the 90s where studios were actually making movies, black movies, movies with directors of color pretty regularly. Um, but they were and genre. Then it, yeah. And then it, they were genre, they were genre, but then that dried up. Be and there was, there was a little bit of diversity within the genre, but it sort of dried up. And the only real place to do it was to just go out there and do it on your own. Mm -hmm. And we shot this movie on film, uh, Super 16, and um, in one month in Memphis, in the middle of the summer. <laughs> it was very hot. <laughs> and it was very much, we really felt like after this long journey, we'd finally gotten the money. I had asked, um, all of my studio connections to fund the movie. 
I had originally set it up with James Seamus when he was running uh, Focus. Um, but at the end of the day, he, he, he only wanted to give us about a million bucks, so, so we took it back. And I think John was so finally um, just upset that nobody would give us the money that he just wrote the check. And then we found ourselves out there doing it. It was great. It you was see? really just not waiting for yes, just doing it, you know, by any means necessary. That's how we felt, and it was a great Great experience. And I like to call it the Lucius Cookie origin story. <laughs> it's nice. Um, but it's fun seeing them. Seeing them together, my ago. God, blowing up in that empire. It's unbelievable. Well, it's empire. It's ta uh, Terrence in Orange is the New Black. Yeah. And of course, Anthony's in Blackish. Right. It's like all the film actors are now holding down TV. That's how it is. He's incredible. I Terry. Mean, Terry. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can see every emotion in this. Well, this is an example of real casting meeting the actor. Because at the time, Terrence was sort of known as Q from The Best Man. <laughs> that was the most impactful role that he'd done. And then he'd done a lot of little things, but never really had his moment. And when we went to him, uh, we said to him, is this all? Is this all there is? Like, what do you see for yourself? Yeah. You know, and, and has um, to have a dream. He, you have to have a dream. <laughs> I mean, this was really, really true. That's right. And he fought us for a really long time, because number one, he did not like rap. He did not want to rap. Since it took us so long to get it done, he wrote an album. He wanted to be a folk singer, <laughs> so he wrote an album. And he is a beautiful guitar player, classical guitar player and singer. But that wasn't working for Craig, so, um, and I don't think he really wanted to be the pimp, you know? I don't think any black man, respecting black man, wants to be the pimp, but, uh, but he You know, when I was. did Glory with Denzel Washington, mm -hmm. he didn't want to play a he slave. He didn't want to play a slave, right. Well, he did pimps not want to play a slave, and we had to get list. back to him, and all back yes. to him, and show him the entire picture, and finally, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it brought him an Oscar, and it brought him, yes. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's a whole nother conversation because that's very interesting just in that statement that playing a pimp and playing a slave is what brought them their Oscar. I don't even know what to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we'll save that for another time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Q &A. <laughs> so let me ask you, um, Boys in the Hood, Sony did somehow Right, they they financed it, and that's not exactly no. But that genre. that's an interesting story because when we when I found the script of Boys in the Hood, I had just been uh, promoted out of the story department, and my job was to read scripts. I was a CE, and I had to go find material. Um, this was so long ago that Warner Brothers and Columbia shared the lot right here. That's how long ago it was. I'm very, very much dating yes. myself, but it yes. was a long time ago. And uh, Dawn, Dawn Steele was the yes. president, but she had just got, I, I, she hired me. I worked for her and Amy Pascal. It was, um, it, it was uh, Tom Rothman, Amy Pascal, Dawn, a um, couple other folks who are producers now. Oh, Lorenzo de Bonaventura. Uh, it was a good group. And then, but the studio was sold. It was basically Coca-Cola sold it to Sony. It was a big upheaval. So at that point, uh, John and Peter came in, uh, Peter Goober and John Peters, they came in and bought the lot over at the Thalberg building in, in Culver City. And so we were moving. That's it was when I was closer to script. their home in the West Probably. Side. But no, they wanted their own Probably. lot. They wanted yes. their own lot. So okay. they purchased that lot. They purchased the Thalberg building. And we were in the process of moving. Well, that's when I read... Be, actually, I was looking to replace myself in the story department, and I heard about John. I was, of course, the only black person in the story department. I said, I have to replace myself with a person of color. John was at school. He was a reader. He came in for the job, and all he wants to talk about is the script he'd written, Boys in the Hood. So I eventually pried it from his grubby little hands and read it in my office and just wept. And I literally knew at that moment what I was there to do. I was there to get that movie made. And um, it was one of those epiphany kind of yeah. moments. Um, 
But I knew that we were in the middle of a move. They were trying to make Ghostbusters 2. There was just like not, not at all on anybody's radar, this yes. little movie about South Central. I went to school in Inglewood. I knew these kids. I related to this mm -hmm. script. And I, 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 I took it to every single executive one by one. This is a good technique, too, producers. You have to circle your wagons. Like going into a group without talking to every single person before you talk to the group is a bad idea. Talk to every single person separately. Tell them why this is important to you, why, why you're even bothering with it, why you're asking them to read something. It's a lot of time. It's a big commitment. So know why, number one, and then be able to articulate it because that's what I did. I went to every single executive separately and I said, do this for me. I had been reading all their scripts and giving them notes. I said, please read this for me. I'll tell you why it's important. I did that for every single person. So by the time we got to the other lot, it must have taken a few weeks. We got to the other lot, everybody had read it. And everybody had promised me that they got it and they were going to support me. And guess what happened? It was kind of crazy. Because we sat there, it was the first weekend <laughs> read meeting, yeah. and everybody was there. And by this time, John and Peter had been kicked upstairs <laughs> somewhere, and Frank Price came in. Oh, so wow. now it was Frank Price. And we went through the whole room, and I just, it was crazy because I thought that I'd made this plan with everybody. Um, but it's a really scary place to be at the table because everybody reads and then you have to express your opinion about it. And that's what people are most afraid of. It's like expressing their opinion at, because they want to say what you want to hear. This is what you find, right? So the people who can really say what they feel are usually the ones that make a name for themselves, I will say that. So um, we sort of went around the whole table. Uh, can you repeat that sentence? Well, I think that you have to have the audacity to be yourself. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, so the people that do saying. say they're okay. Yes. So we got to uh, Amy, and Amy was very supportive. She was my girl. She was my road dog. She said, the, I mean, the writing was undeniable. The writing was undeniable. But it was not something they were familiar with. And again, it's really important. I, I can't believe that. When was this? 20 some years ago at the studio. I was the only executive of color. No, maybe Kevin Jones was there, but I could count them on one hand. And guess what? I can still count them on one hand. That is 20 some years later. And the reason that we had a run at Columbia of John Singleton and Robert Rodriguez and Darnell Martin is because I was at the table. I was the one saying, this is important to me. This is the movie we should make. This is why I want to make this movie. Because I had, I related to it. I had sensitive eyes to the material. It wasn't that the other people were racist or bad or anything. They just didn't have the sensitivity to that material. They didn't. They couldn't express to each other why it was passionately important to them because it just wasn't. And um, so, so basically, we turned to Frank Price, and Frank Price really is a guy who really doesn't give up. He just says what he wants to say. Yeah. And he was like, I think we should make it. <laughs> right there. And by this time, I was sweating. I was like, I was so betrayed. I was like, oh, my god. My heart was beating fast, you know. I was sitting there just holding myself back from arguing with them about it, you know, because yeah. you can't. You've got to put your stuff on the table, and everybody gets to throw their, their stuff at it, you know. Um, but yeah, then he said he was going to do it. So I was happy. He was like that Frank Price, he by was. the way. He didn't care. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What's interesting is uh, a person of color and also a woman. So in both right. cases, you were definitely, you know, in the minority in a lot of right. these rooms. That's right. Was Still the case. Underrepresented. Yeah. Yes. So I had to represent. Right. That's right. Right. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. <laughs> so the the beauty of boys was that we. I had no idea. They had to promote me. I was a CE. They had to promote me to VP, which I, I, I jumped over director development right to VP because there was nobody to supervise it. <laughs> and you had to be a VP to supervise. So I got this huge raise. I got the VP. And I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. 
and I had to fake it till I made it. That's how I did it. That's how I got through it. You know, you have to be reasonably smart and you have to watch and listen, but then you just have to kind of fake it. And then you learn just by doing it, right? So, um, yeah, so I didn't know, but uh, all I, I did know that I had to put John with a great producer. So um, I put him with Steve Nicolaitis, who had produced a lot of Rob Reiner's movies. It was a cool white dude I knew. I knew him, you know, he had made movies. So I was like, maybe you should meet him. And they loved each other right off. And uh, so then, then the studio was so busy, they literally didn't care. They were like, here's $5 million, knock yourself out. Just let you we got movies to make. So um, Ghostbusters 2. Ghostbusters yeah. 2, right. <laughs> Last action hero, here we come. So, um, so that's what we did. And I just sort of, as an executive, you know, executive is a very different job from producer, but I, I was more with, I always knew I was more with the camp, with the, with the production. I sort of knew that, you know, and um, so I stayed with them a lot. And then, uh, you know, we made this great movie very, in a very short amount of time. We, it was, everything happened so quickly. I think we started shooting in August or prep in August and, and by May we were on the carpet at Cannes. That's how crazy it was. Wow. And we got off the plane in Cannes with Ice Cube and John and, all the paparazzi were there, and it was just crazy. It was just I'm sort of surprised. Surreal. I'm surprised that they send it to Cannes. That's kind of it's not exactly well because was, they always say that you know it was in movie. certain regard. That's what it was. It, it was, was what with cer a certain regard. It was the uh, sidebar yeah. competition. Certain regard, yeah. yeah. So anyway, <clears throat> and then we got a 20 minute stand of standing ovation at the premiere in, in, in France, and that's when we sort of knew, wow, this is this is something. This is really something. Because, you know, because I worked at a student's own office and you can never get a propose a black film because they said it doesn't travel abroad. That's and right. then you go to Cannes and the French seem to understand it and other people seem to understand it. Right. And it's like, then they say it's an aberration. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So um, I read today, and maybe it's total bullshit, and you can set the record straight one way or the other. Mm that when you um, set up your company, homegrown, by the way, I love that, um, you sold your house and you started a company? Mm. Never do it. <laughs> <laughs> terrible, terrible idea. Terrible idea about how um, fabulous it turned out. It Tell me turn about that. Well, what had I happened would never was, yeah. I was um, really unhappy. I. I worked at the studio. Um, I left the studio to go run Jim Henson Pictures. That was a disaster. I made <laughs> five movies. They were all disasters. My Muppet movie, if you ever see it, it's terrible. But it opens with Kermit singing Brick House. Okay, so it's an aberration. Elmo and Grouch Land was my other big movie. Um, I had kids running for the aisles during the uh, <laughs> preview screenings. It was horrifying. They were running, screaming, trying to get out of there. It was so bad that we ended up putting Bert and Ernie in the movie, freezing the movie and going, don't worry, kids. Everything's going to be OK. <laughs> <laughs> I hired Mandy Patankin to be a bad guy. It was a, it was a total disaster. <laughs> Uh, and then, you know, to make matters worse, I fell in love with my boss and got fired. I mean, it, it could not have been worse. But then I, then I got off the wheel. Then I fell off the wheel. Then I was out of the rat race of Hollywood. Because, you know, yes. once you're in it, you are in it. You're in one. Yeah. And you've got to keep up. There's too much information coming that you have to know about. You have to read the trades. You have to... Right read the scripts, you have to see the movies. It's a full-time job, you yeah. know? So I got out and I was 40 years old. I had a 16-year-old son, uh, a six-year-old son. I was divorced by that time um, and living on my own, this fabulous house in Hancock Park and going, what is going on? So then I just started doing what I did before. I started dancing. Uh, I was a dancer. I went to uh, CalArts grad school for dance. Uh, I was a writer. 
So I started writing. So I wrote, I danced every day. Oh my God, I was in great shape. <laughs> my son <laughs> was 16. He, he fancied himself, you know, a dancer, but I was like, you're no dancer. <laughs> you're no dancer until you can look at that combo and do it right then on the spot. So I took him with me, went to the Edge, which is a really fun place, and we learned, we did hip hop dancing. Um, and, that, and I made dinner. I was such a good mom. I was so good. And then, um, and then I got really bored. And I was like, okay, now what? What am I going to do? And then Erwin Stoff called me and said, do you want to work at Three Arts? And I was like, sure. I'll do that. Um, that didn't last either because I'm not like a management agent type, you know. Yeah. And I was allegedly doing a production wing, but that wasn't true because you either, you know, Put the, put the clients in the movie, or if you have a project, oh, it was too complicated. Anyway, what I ended up doing is finding House on Flow. And then I found that script, and I thought, this is what I want to do. My contract was done. And I said, yeah, I don't want to do that. I'm just going to figure out how to make this movie. Um, and then that turned into four years of like peddling it around town. And I just, I woke up one day and I was like, I don't need the house. It's holding me back. You know, I'm, I have to pay this mortgage. I've got kids going to NYU by this time. I was like, I can't do it. I'm single. Ugh, oh, it, was, it was a hard, hard time. And I woke up um, and I just called my broker and I said, sell the house. Now, this was a really bad idea because. It was when the house prices were just starting to really take off. Oh. But I had to divest. I knew it. I had to get rid of it. It sold in like two seconds. I didn't even have a place to live. That's how fast it sold. So I went to, um, you know, I went backwards. I was going backwards. I went back to the, you know, duplex or whatever, you know. Then even I went further back. I went back to Park La Brea. You know what I mean? It was like, oh. that's right. I was going having way a back. house in Hancock Park. But oh, the man. freedom, because what it enabled me to do, so I, 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 I did make money on the house. I mean, I'm not dumb. I did make some money on the house, and I said, I'm going to take 250 of it and, and make this movie. That was my plan. I was tired of waiting for yes. Nobody wanted to give me yes. And I wanted yes, so I had to make yes. So I took the money, I called my friend John, and I said, look, I got the hottest script in town. You gotta read it. And he was like, okay, okay, okay. I gave it to him, months went by. I was like, oh, Jesus, what am I doing? I'm sitting in Park La Brea. <laughs> I got this bank account, but no job, nothing to do. And then he calls me, I remember, it was Cinco de Mayo. He was on the set of Fast and the, uh, uh, mixing Fast and the Furious, the, the version he did. And he said, this shit is great. <laughs> and I was like, isn't it great? Have you finished it? He's like, no, no, no. I haven't finished it, but it's great. And that, it was the kind of script when you started reading it, you just yeah, got yeah. so excited that yes. you were just like, I'm in the, in the midst of greatness. And then um, I said, well, finish it and then call me. So then he, no, he goes, come down here. You have to come down here. So I went down to the Universal soundstage. Everybody had margaritas. And um, we just, and I just said, look, here's what we have to do. We have to make it ourselves, and it's going to be great. And he was like, no, no, no. I can get all this money. I'm making Fast and the Furious. It's going to make all this money. Don't worry. We got this. We got this. And, and, and that's, that's when we peddled it back around. I must have gone to everybody five times. I think I went to everybody five times. They passed me five times before I showed it at Sundance. And um, uh, so anyway, he finally just wrote the check. Now we've circled all the roof guys. But I will talk about another movie that I really, really love making, uh, which is Woman Power All the Way, Something New. Are my girls in the room? Yeah. Okay. So Something New was um, basically the, my life story, a part of my life story. I, um, um, Black executive woman, married to an artistic white guy, shit from your family, and then, um, yeah, kind of trying to figure it out. Um, and it was all women. It was a woman writer. It was a woman director. It was a woman first AD. It was, it was just a, a wonderful, wonderful set, and we had a good time making that movie. I always like talking. I think I'm going to do it at the festival. You know, I also run the L.A. Film Festival. I was going to get so, that. So um, 
Yeah, so it's coming out June 10th through the 18th. It's going to be awesome. Uh, El Elvis Mitchell is my head curator. Um, and uh, my goal is to make it the most diverse mainstream festival in the world. And I think I can do that here in L.A. Um, and it's also the exhibition arm of Film Independent. Film Independent is the 30-year-old arts organization that really supports artists who are diverse and innovative and have a unique point of view. And we also produce the Spirit Awards, the Film Festival, Film Independent at LACMA, and a host of programs uh, throughout the year. So if you don't know about it, you should know. If, you don't, if you're not a member, you should become a member. It's $90, and you get all the movies that are nominated for Spirit Awards in your mailbox. It's, all, it's, like, it's, like, it's like a precursor to when you're in the Academy, and you get all the stuff. But you get your own little section at this level, and it's great. It's great. I think it's great. Yeah. And they have really great program and you feel you're part of your community once you leave the school exactly and you say what now that's right and you don't have let houses me just tell you guys, to sell let me just tell you guys then, so justin <laughs> simeon how many have you guys seen dear white people yeah. 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 so justin simeon is a product of film independent he was in the project involved program um and um that was that i've only made two independent movies in my whole career hustle and flow and dear white people um and I'm proud of, of both of them. I love that movie. Uh, it's a brand. It's a movement. It's not just a movie. Um, I know. So. I just watched it um, a month ago. You did? Yeah, yeah on DVD. Yeah. I wanted to see it when it came out and, you know, never got around. And now it's right. like, I right. loved it. I thought, well, this and, is... look, and look how uh, timely it was. Oh, my God. Way. Yes. No, we, the reason... In, in Dear White People, that at the end of the movie, we put the real pictures of the kids from Duke and Dartmouth on the thing, is because at the time, we're like, people aren't going to believe this is happening. They're just not going to believe it. We have to let them know it's real. And of course, now you can just watch Fox News, and you can see the boys in the, in the bus, you know, and you know it's real. Um, so yeah, that was, that was good. Uh, guys, if you want, we can sit here and talk all day, but I okay. think uh, you <laughs> need to go and ask your questions and line up behind uh, the microphone over the there. The other movie I wanted to mention is Beyond the Lights. Yes. Wasn't that beautiful? <laughs> I think it used to be called Blackbird, so it was, it was announced as Blackbird, but, but Gina, Gina prince Bythewood, she's a real deal black love. Google and bought the raw. If you don't know, you will know. She's a super duper movie star, and uh, that was super good too. And in I fact, every single key role was inhabited by a woman on that show. I'm talking DP, editor, production designer, costume designer, wow. music supervisor, producer, writer, director. All of them were women on that show. How do you find money for all that stuff? Uh, I do a good talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Zanana, um, and I, <laughs> I have to admit, when Hustle and Flow came out, I was like, I'm not going. To, I'm not watching this, <laughs> you know, because it was, uh, yeah, yeah. And I was like, I'm not doing it. And so finally, probably maybe two years ago, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to watch it because uh, you know people were telling me it's a really good movie, it's a really good film, and it was, I, I enjoyed it. And um, then I watched uh, the making of the film, and then I was shocked to hear that you all had so much of an issue trying to get money. And I was like, wow, you know, these people, you know, they're well known. And, and I'm thinking to myself, and I'm not well known, and how, well, <laughs> how am I going to get money for my film? Um, I was like, okay. Um, but it was inspiring, too, because it, it, it just let me know that, you know, you – you have to do whatever it takes. If you're passionate about film or whatever you want to do, then you have to put your best foot forward and do what you have to do. And then I, I thought it was interesting that I think um, in your interview you were saying that the uh, the scene with uh, the little the child and when she when he put his his hoe out or whatever because she was being disrespectful was very hard for you. And I know there's like a slight tug of war. Well, how are we going to do this? And you know you said. But anyway, it ended up being the way it was. And I even when I see it now, it was hard to see, but it's really, it's really good, though. I mean, it's, it's touching, and it, it's, it, just, uh, it just brought up a lot of feelings. And I was just like, wow. But it, it's, it was just a good film, period. But I just commend you, commend you, period, for just being out there and doing what you got to do, you know. So. Uh, thank you. appreciate that. 
just to follow up on that, I got a lot of flack for the pimps and hoes from black women in Hollywood. Black, um, well, there's not that many black women, but the five black women in Hollywood <laughs> gave me tons of shit. Um, but the reason I wanted to make that movie is because I really, truly believe that if a pimp can be elevated through art, then we all can. So that's why I did it. Yes. Uh, well, um, I want to thank you for one of my favorite movies, Hustle and Flow. And I want to thank you for one of my other favorite movies, Something New. Oh, um, all right. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, you talked about getting flack a moment ago, and um, I wanted to ask you if you got flack from people because the screenwriter of Hustle and Flow is a white man. That's your question, yes. Actually, I think that I did get a little blowback on that. Um, and I will say that it's very important to me that the author of the story is um, authentic to the story. I'm very suspect of a white gaze going on to uh, black story, black bodies. Um, not that it can't be done, but I definitely will double take. But I flew down to Memphis to meet Craig and hang out with him. And um, he was the real deal, you know. This was not his neighborhood, so to speak, but these were his people. I met a, I met, I, it was just a very um, diverse crowd that he hung with, and I felt that his compassion for those characters was very real. Um, he's, he's, he lived a, a bit of a marginal life uh, as he was trying to make this movie. I mean, this movie is actually um, a sort of an incarnation of uh, how they got the money together to make his, to make his movie. Um, but, um, but yeah, Craig's a real deal, and I would always check that out. I'm not, I wouldn't, I'm not going to say that you have to be black to direct a black movie, because I don't think you have to be white to direct a white movie, you know, so. Uh, but I do make sure that it's, it's an authentic voice, and by that I mean somebody who's very sensitive to the characters in the story. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. I just want to thank you for your time tonight. Mm -hmm. um, I'll date myself a little bit. So when this movie came out, I, I was born and raised in Mississippi, and I grew up listening to like 3-6 Mafia and all those bands. And so when it came out, I was like, oh, what is Hollywood going to know about Memphis and rap? And then I watched it, and there was that authenticity that you talked about. So you kind of bit in a little bit of my question, a little bit about so where that authenticity came from. It sounds like it was Craig Brewer, because he used guys from like Swisher House with like Mike Jones and and A Ball and MJG references and stuff like that. So was that that was the key thread to all that kind of di no, knowledge and everything. And so then how did he get that to you? I guess I'll, I'll just go with that. That's a good question. So yeah, those were his friends. Um, he knew 3-6, he knew Juicy J. Um, and uh, it got to me because he made a movie before this. The movie before this was The Poor and Hungry. And The Poor and Hungry played a lot of festivals. Um, and off of the, that movie, he got an agent. And that agent knew me. And so the agent read the script, called me up, um, and said, I want you to read the script and watch the movie. Um, I did the same thing John did. I, re I was like halfway in. I called him. I was like, I love this. <laughs> he said, well, have you finished? I said, no. He said, OK, finish. <laughs> so I finished. Uh, because you know, it's, it's not a, oh, and it all works out. I mean, it does work out, but it's, it's, a, it's a darker ending. Um, but yeah, so that's how I got it. Traditional you know, route. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Dakota. From the screenwriting department. Great. Loved the movie. First time I saw it. Oh, uh, wow. And thank you for being here. Uh, I was going to ask you as a uh, producer and creative executive, what jump jumps off the page as like, this is a great script. This is going to be a movie. Or on the other hand, this needs to go in the garbage. This is not going anywhere. Like what's what stands out for a writer and an original voice? Okay. That's a great question. Um, I would like to announce that I am an official member of the WGA as well. I just got hired by New Line to write the Misty Copeland movie. 
which is the black ballerina, who is the first solo ballerina at ABT. Is there no end to what you can do? <laughs> um, and I, I, I've always loved writing. I mean, that's actually how I got into this business, because I love stories. I mean, I can remember as a young girl reading The Godfather and then going to see it at the El Rey, you know, reading The Exorcist and going to the Wiltern to see the movie. I was really into the, comp the, the, the relationship between the page and the screen. And um, so I studied English at school. That was, uh, that was my thing. And uh, with an emphasis in creative writing, um, then life caught up to me pretty quickly because I, um, I got pregnant right, right out of school and sort of became um, um, less interested in my own creative pursuits um, for a while. So um, I say all that to say I, I became a reader and I read a lot. I think my biggest education in this business has been my years as a, as a script reader. I started at CAA um, as a book reader for Bob Bookman, who's a, who's, a, who's a classic agent and wonderful guy at CAA. Um, I got that job when I was um, with, a, with a newborn um, because it was something I could do with the baby. I could, I could, I could nurse and read. No, like this, you know. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, it's like the ultimate multitasking. And um, so, so the, the process of reading educates you so much. You guys should be reading every single thing you can get your hands on. And not only just reading them, but writing your own coverage, just for yourself. You know, a, a, a paragraph of synopsis. First of all, this is what you do. Log line. Make it real short and sweet. Capture what it is. Then do a half. Then do a little paragraph synopsis, and then a paragraph of comments and notes. That discipline, and I'm saying I did it when we had typewriters. I'm so old. I can't believe it. I did it when we had typewriters at CAA. We would read the thing, and then we'd go sit at the typewriter, put the paper in, and just start writing it. I mean, the only thing you had was like whiteout. You couldn't even go back. Remember? Right. Yeah. And. Um, so that, but that was my education, really. And what happens is you start to assimilate the form that works. So that by page 10, if nothing's happening, you're like going, why isn't anything happening? Like your instinct just sort of kicks in, you know? At the end of the first act, you're like, well, how come they're not in the new world yet? You know what I'm saying? Like, why, how, how, why are we still at the same place where we've been at for the last half hour? I don't get it. You start to know what should be happening. And then you can sort of, when you have that form down, and then I've also done a lot of reading, which I totally recommend for, you know, you have to read Sid Field. You have to read Linda Seeger. You have to read uh, all of those books. You have to read Save the Cat. You know, you have to read all of them because they're all saying the same thing, number one. And number two, it's just a different way of saying it. So whatever way you key into, that's, that's, that's it. You know, story, Robert McKee, is so heady. I mean, I like to sort of just dream about it and then go, okay, I don't, I, that's too much for me. But, um, but those forms are your, those are your, um, your pillars really. So first of all, you have to know all of the form, then you have to read a ton of stuff, and then you have to write synopses and, and log lines. And if you do that for a thousand scripts, you will be a master because you will understand form so well that you will pick up a script and you'll just know like so quickly whether this is, a, this is somebody who is taking you on a ride, somebody who's confidently telling you a story or not. And that's how that's that's how I read. That's how I read. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. you know, it's funny because somebody was that I knew sent me a script recently, and I read thirty six pages. And I, uh, anyway, and even that was because I don't want to read scripts anymore. But anyway, and I told him what I thought about the thirty six pages, and he said, "Oh, that's what everybody told me the same thing who finished the script." Mm. So I can see now right. already because of all the scripts that we read all the Absolutely. time. Even in 36, I already can see where it's heading and what's the problem in the 36. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, before I used to feel that I have to read the whole script. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, no, don't, I, don't, I don't feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> and also, the, the writing of the log line is so important because it's actually teaching you how to pitch. 
It's actually teaching you yeah. how to how to synopsize, how to encapsulate, how to how to how to pull the the subject, you know, the the protagonist, how to how to pit that protagonist against an obstacle, and how to suggest a possible conclusion, and that's really when you're in a room and you're pitching that's what you're telling this is a story about a guy who does it, a woman who does this and faces all this and you know maybe or maybe doesn't do it yeah yes hello my name is hans and i'm in the filmmaking program hello hans hello um i thought it was very interesting to hear you talking about um you were working with john singleton on boys on the hood uh -huh. And I was just curious how about how it came about with you working with Robert Rodriguez and got his career started. Basically. Okay, so um, Robert, Rod so when I did Boys in the Hood, I was like a huge star after that because people were like, "Who is this girl? And what is that movie?" And that movie made sixty-five million dollars off a five million dollar, you know, uh, uh, budget. And and John was nominated for two Oscars, and it was all over the news and. Unfortunately, people died in the theater the first weekend. You know, it was like there was just this whole sort of perfect storm that happened, right? And because of it, I got totally left alone at the studio. They're like, well, whatever she's doing, she's doing it right. So just keep on doing it. You don't have to do less action hero anymore. And I was like, so grateful. So basically, um, I got a call from Robert Newman, who is still his agent. At, uh, he was at ICM at the time. He's at William Morris Endeavor now. And um, he said, um, I have a movie for you to watch. It was on an A-track. No, yeah, VHS, right? Uh, so I pop it in at home. Um, and we're eating dinner, and it's in Spanish, and it's so good. I don't even have to, and I know a little Spanish, but it wasn't that. I just, just the visual storytelling was so good. So I was like, who is this guy? He's like, this dude, Robert. He does it all. He's a cartoonist. He's a that. I was like, okay. I got on a plane. This is very important, too. you got to go with artists. That means so much to them. They're like, she came all this way. So good. Um, and I got down there, and I met his mom, and I met his dad, and I met his 12 siblings, and I took him out for barbecue. <laughs> and, um, you know, I said, uh, let's do this. Come back to the studio. And um, so he did. And we remade that movie. Well, actually, first we finished it because it wasn't even you know, assembled really like the, the film. We made it, we, we, we added like a million dollars to it. This was a $7,000 movie that we added a million dollars to and we released it. <laughs> and then he wanted to remake it because that was the deal. I said, come on back, we'll remake it. It'll be big, everybody will see it. And then Peter Goober had the great idea to just like, no, this will be the $7,000 studio movie and we're gonna release it. So that's what we did. Um, and then, he basically wanted to do another movie. It was Dutch Prado. Um, but there was no Mexican star. I'll just be honest. There was no Diego Luna. There was no Gael. There was only Antonio Banderas, who, by the way, is not Mexican. He's Spanish. And so, and he was like, no, it has to be Mexican. And I was like, dude, there's no Mexican. It has to be Antonio. <laughs> and so, um, and so I brought Antonio to the studio. This is the good thing about being in the studio. The really cool thing is like, you can do whatever you want to do. It's like, you just call people up and go, I'm calling from Columbia Pictures. And I'd like, <laughs> I'd like to, Mr. Banderas to come to the studio for a private screening of, you know, uh, uh, El yeah. Mariachi. And that's what happened. And I remember Antonio did not speak English. I did was practicing a little bit of my Spanish. And um, I showed him the movie. He was really impressed. I don't know how. I Basically, I think what happened is they said, dude, we're not making a movie unless you make it with Antonio. So Robert was sort of forced to do it. And then, of course, now they're muse and director. Yes. Um, I forgot the question. <laughs> no, you answered it great. You answered it. I did? Yeah. Oh, okay. We asked Didn't you matter. about how did you get okay. to Rodriguez. Good. Thanks. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Ricardo. Um, I'm in a producing program. Uh, my question was actually very similar to his question, uh, so I'm going to rephrase it a little bit. Um, I guess the question is, 
you know, you've worked with a lot of young directors, you know, someone like Rodriguez. Um, is there a quality that they seem to possess that you would say that, like, a common trait that these people kind of have in common that you can kind of detect? And um, besides that, also, I really liked Muppets from Space when I, I was did. a kid. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. All right. It's a stoner movie. <laughs> um, okay. Alma from Grouchland scared me, though. It did? Yeah. Why, right, how old were you? Six. Yeah, see? <laughs> Messed it up. Um, <laughs> okay, so what was your question? Uh, my question was just like uh, you, these young directors. Oh, what do I see? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so a couple things. One, <clears throat> It's got to be on the page. I really am attracted to writer-directors because the one thing I learned at the studio is that those movies are made by a committee, and that's why they don't seem that good, you know? And that the movies that were made by one vision, by one voice, they may be flawed, but they were so much more interesting to me. They, I felt the humanity in them. So I, so I was like, ah, and John really taught me this because when he showed up, I tried to do the studio on him. I was like, we've got to change this, you know, cop, Singleton, okay. cops don't eat donuts and you know, this whole thing. And he was like, I will strangle you if you touch anything in this movie. And I was like, ooh, okay. And then I basically, he sort of, he, 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 put, indoctrinated. he indoctrinated me into being a, 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 a writer-director's producer, which is to protect the vision. And you, you either have to buy into it or you don't. You can, you can challenge for sure, but it has to be challenged coming from a buy-in, you know? So it always starts with the script for me. I got to read a piece of material that makes me laugh or cry or, or scared or something. You know, and if it moves me, and it's always my gut, I literally know my heart starts beating fast. I, it's like love. I'm like, oh, oh my God, this is so good. That's how I feel. And if I feel that way, I know I can go the distance on it. As a producer, you should right. not take anything on that you're just okay about because you think it's a good piece of business or because you think it'd be good to attract some actor or something. Mm -hmm. It will never happen. Yeah. The only thing that can literally alchemically create something out of nothing which is what you're doing in a movie you're taking you're taking ideas that are crystallized as a blueprint really on a page and then getting everybody to sort of have this mind meld on it it's crazy and and it's really difficult to do it well because there's no science to it you know so so you have to find material that you can you can stick with forever because sometimes that's how long it takes. You know, you have to find something that means something to you. And so when I read something that someone else has poured their heart into, um, I, I respond. And then I meet the person. And then I see if that person, how that person is with me. You know, if that person makes me want to go knock down doors to, to make it happen, then, then I take it on. If that person irks me or, or, yeah. or, or, or feels entitled or or doesn't feel like there's room to grow. You know, the, 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 the writer-directors that I, and I've, I've done a lot of first-time writer-directors, and it, it's super fun because they don't know anything, and they're so, like, the dream is so big, you know? Um, and, and I love that beginner's mind because it's just, it's just malleable but focused. And so I look for that. That's what I look for. I look for something that turns me on that and then I meet the person and see if, if it's embodied in that person because you have to spend a lot of time with these people and you have to ask for money and you have to ask for favors. You have to stand in the middle of the night at four in the morning. It's cold or it's hot or whatever. It's, 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 a, it's a relationship, you know? So I just look for the good material and then the cool people that wrote it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if, if I can add to that, though, um, yeah. and you mention it very lightly, but I think it's really commendable and very inspiring for this kind of audience, is that you have a, a long history with first-time directorial debut artists. And, you know, for the audience, you have one time to make your first film. And the fact that you've been a champion for that is pretty spectacular. So it, it's uh, and challenging, I'm sure. 
but obviously still very rewarding. Um, so you're definitely looking for a kernel that no one else has found yet, which is pretty great and inspiring. Hi, my name is Elaine. Hi, Elaine. <laughs> um, all right, this, this is a really important question. My heart is pounding out of my chest. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, you said you went to high school in Eaglewood? St. Mary's Academy. So coming from someone who uh, was born and raised in inner city, <clears throat> like from Providence, Rhode Island, uh, what decisions did you have to make once you saw, because when you're raised in that environment, you kind of don't see what's beyond it. Um, and I experienced that. Um, what decisions did you find yourself making once you, once you saw beyond that and, uh, to persevere and to, um, not only as a black woman, but as a, as, as a woman, <laughs> not only as a minority, but as a woman to, um, that gave you hope to do such a career in, in this, such an industry, uh, and how did you find hope to uh, tell these stories? Um, and yeah. <laughs> Excellent question. Excellent question. <laughs> and well asked. Um, yeah, you know, I had no idea how movies were made. I didn't understand that there was a director and a producer. Yeah. I, I, I really didn't um, until, um, I guess, when I got to college. I got to college and fell in love with a filmmaker. That's, mm -hmm. that's basically, and then, then and I, he put me in the movies, I was acting in the movies, I was around it, I loved the sort of clubhouse of it, you know. Um, but I was still just an, like an English major who danced a lot, and, um, and I think that um, I've always read a lot of biographies, too. This is one thing that I've done since I was very young. It's, I'm inspired by people who, you know, you know, you, you read the Clara Barton story, right? It's like those, those biographies, and I think it was fifth grade when I just sort of devoured like the whole library of, of biographies because when you look around and you realize that everything that anyone's ever built was just built by somebody else, you know what I mean? It's not brain surgery. It's just you have to find the thing that you're really passionate about, then you have to become an expert at it. And, and in that process, you build your confidence, you build connections, you build uh, 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 opportunities and the, the opportunities manifest. So I'm a big, big believer in um, creating my own reality. And the way I do that is, first of all, I'm really in touch with what um, I want, you know, what, what, I, what, I, what I aspire to do. Then I get educated on it and I say, okay, well, uh, if there's somebody who is an executive, because when I started, I thought, um, I didn't have in my head I was going to be a producer executive. I just had in my head, I want to read scripts, because I really like to read. It's super duper easy. And when I started, I did it for free, just because it was something I could do and it was easy to do. Mm -hmm. Then I got paid like $25 a script. And this is like after I had a kid. This is after I graduated college. Then I got paid fifty dollars a script, and I was like, "Okay." <laughs> then I heard about this job called Reader, and I was like, "There's a job called Reader? <laughs> I want that job." <laughs> so I heard that there's a place called CAA that had a whole department of readers. I, like one person told me that, and I was like, "Okay, well, who do I call?" They said, "Well, you call the head. You know, you call this agent who is." Is, is the agent in charge. It was Andrea, it was Andrea, Andrea Newman. Do you remember Andrea Newman? It was Andrea Newman. I called Andrea Newman once a week until she said, fine, take the job. <laughs> I was polite, but I was like, look, I'm calling about this job. I know I'm really good at it. I, I put together, and everybody should have one of these because Reading is really good for you, and, and it makes money, and it's not so hard, which is, uh, you know, three samples, coverage, scripts that people know, right, so they can know what you're talking about, and, and just do the log line, do the thing, do the, do the comments, and 
keep that as your sort of, you know, uh, card. card. Business card. Exactly. So then I, 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 I started reading there, and then I, that created more opportunities. Because then I was in there, and I saw these agents. This is when Mike Opitz was running the joint. I was like, huh, okay. So there's all these clients. There's all these writers. You know, you just, you just, your world grows. You don't, you can't get to there, you can't get to the end game from the get-go. You've got to go through the process. And the process is actually the good stuff, you know. So I just envisioned, then I was like, oh. Then I heard that there was a studio job called Story Analyst, which is basically just a reader. And then I was like, oh, that was a union. The base pay was 50 thou a year, and all you had to do is read seven scripts a week. I was like, I am in the money. <laughs> so then I found out that you had to sort of audition for it, take some kind of test, read some script in the room and do the thing. I did that. I got in. I was working at Fox. That's where I met Amy, right? Amy was a VP there. Scott Rudin was running the joint. Then she called me up one day and she said, I love your coverage. You're so smart. Will you be my reader? And I was like, sure. So then Amy brought me into the room, and then I watched her talk to writers and directors, and I was like, mm -hmm, okay, got this. <laughs> and then I became the writer of all the notes. That was an education. And then she left to go to Columbia with Dawn. I left to go to Warner Brothers because they were going to hire me for $75,000 for the same job. And so I was like, look, I got I got to go make this money. I'm going to go to Warner Brothers. I'll check you later. I got to Warner Brothers. I was there for a month. 1988, writer's strike. Fired. Last hired. First fired. I called Amy. I was like, guess what? She said, come on. I started working for her on Monday and uh, worked for them. So every opportunity, you gain experience. You gain contacts. You gain proficiency in what you want to do. And that'll get you there. But it's also good to then when I got there, I was like, oh, there's another job I want. It's called creative exec. Huh. How do I get that? You know? And then I said, Amy, how do I get that job? She said, you work for me for a year. And then I introduce you to Dawn. So I had to work for a year. I worked for a year. I was like, my year's up. Where's my meeting? <laughs> she said, I set it up. She set it up. I got that job, then I got in the house, because it used to be, and I don't know if they do this now, but the readers lived in the, in the, um, in the lot, in the, what do you call those, um, they're like trailers. That's the what bungalows? they Bungalows? They're not oh, bungalows. Not even. They're trailers. They're little tra oh. They're trailers. Mm. I got out of the trailer into the big house. Now I was in the big house with all the execs, and that's when I, when I you know, made, made some moves. But the other thing that's really important, you guys, is to be nice. You know what I mean? Like all the people, like my assistant is Mike, was Mike Farah, who now runs Funny or Die and has like 29 TV shows on the air. You know what I'm saying? So it's a small town and uh, a little bit of, uh, of just common sense goes a long way. Thank Did that you. help? Yes. Okay. Hello, my name is Christopher Welcome, as in thank you, you're welcome. I like um, that. <laughs> Um, my question is, I grew up in the 90s, and my parents grew up during the civil rights movement. My parents are pretty old. And um, so I always heard the stories of, you know, especially coming to Hollywood to work as a producer of all things and being black, that I was crazy. My friends at home still are waiting on me to tell them that I'm coming home on the one way, and I'm like, I'm not doing it. As far as having a career of longevity so far in Hollywood... What do you see the trajectory for African Americans in this industry, and how do you feel it will sustain with the turbulence, if I may, that we've seen lately with the Oscar snubs and all the other things that have happened as of recently that are pushing to the forefront the topic of will we see more African Americans on screen as well as behind? You watch Empire? I've Blackish? seen a couple of em episodes of Empire, but I'm more of a power fan, and I do watch a few episodes of Blackish. Okay, so here's the thing. The, the one thing that will create momentum is if we patronize our own stuff, okay? Because that's, that's the first step, is to really be proficient on what is out there that African-American producers, writers, directors, actors are doing. And um, so that, that would be the first thing. I, I, 
Look, I'm a producer, which means I'm an optimist. I just see that the world is changing. I know that the census is telling us that more brown babies are born every day than white babies. That's the reality, you know? There's got to be entertainment for all these folks coming. So, you know, <laughs> I, I'm sitting in the catbird seat now, you know. Um, so I think that, um, yeah, just do your thing, you know. I mean, find out what, what is the story that you want to tell. That's what you got to do. Just find the story that you are uniquely qualified to tell. And I heard That's what Lee Daniel does, you know. Yeah. Yes. And I heard you talk about, you know, selling your house and going through that. And there are a lot of good scripts, but just because the script is good to you does not mean it'll be good to the masses, which is what it takes to accumulate revenue. But how do you know when you should take a move like that? Because sometimes it is pertinent that, you know, I need to up and move, but sometimes you do it at the wrong time or you don't do it and you realize that that was the right time. How do you, how do you trust your gut well, here's on that? Here's the thing. When I say trust your gut, I trust that as a human being, I respond to emotions. So I know if a piece, if piece of material is triggering my emotions, then I'm going to guess if I can produce the best version of that material that it's going to strike a lot of other people's emotions. I don't, I don't look for things that I think other people are going to want. I look for things that I'm going to want. That's the only, only gut I got, you know. I think trying to second guess the marketplace or, or do things that, because the masses will want, never work out. Never work out for you. You gotta just bring your own to it. And the way to do that is to really think about who you are. Uh, I think so much, you know, we're so distracted. I mean, oh, I just saw the Steve Jobs uh, doc. It is just so, so upsetting. Um, you know, I love my iPhone. I love my MacBook, but God, I should throw them as far away as possible. <laughs> you know, it's created this uh, alone togetherness, right? And um, people don't just sit alone without their phones, you know? They gotta have it, it's crazy. And so if you sat alone without your phone and you remembered who you were at eight years old, who you were intrinsically, not who you were trying to be, but what do you know about yourself? Like I knew when I was really young that I was smart. I just knew it, you know? I, I, I knew that. That was a truth about me. Um, what do you know about yourself at that age before you sort of grew into who you are now? And if you can remember who you were, who you are, and you bring that to everything you do, there, there will be an authenticity to you that will be irresistible. People will just be like, God, I don't know what it is, but I really like her. <laughs> and you will be attracting the kind of people that you're connecting with. Because if you're being authentic, you're either going to, people are going to be like, oh, you're not my people. Or they're going to be like, you're my people. It's going to be really clear. But if you're sort of hiding behind something else, then you, the other people's doing that, then you never really get clarity. So what you guys can all do is to bring to the situation who you really are and, and unabashedly, like, you know, e even if it's, if, it's, if it's like, you know, generous. Like some people you just know, like you give away stuff. You're just like, that's who you are intrinsically. Then be that, then, then practice that, you know? It's the quickest way, I think, to, to, to attain what you want and, and, and to be enlightened to the fact that, you know, we're just all here for such a short time and uh, we get caught up in so much negativity that it prevents us from really achieving all, all that we can achieve, all that we dream and that we want. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Angelina. I'm in the screenwriting program. Mm -hmm. First, I want to thank you for giving us your time. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, my question to you is, how much does a script change from the time that you first read it to the time that it's on the screen? And also, do you have, like, do you influence the change in any of the scripts that you work with? 
Um, okay, that's a good question. You know, um, I would say that Boys in the Hood really didn't change that much at all. I'll say the same thing for Hustle and Flow. Didn't really change much at all. Um, little things, but nothing significant. Um, Something New was a script that um, started out as another script and evolved into what it became. Um, and yeah, you know, I'm like an editor. I'm, I read, I, I do notes, I, I know my structure really well, so I can use that to sort of help guide the writer if they're going off path, if something's not landing. Um, I ask a lot of questions instead of trying to impose ideas when I'm giving notes. Just like, are you trying to do this? Because this is what it's coming off as, as opposed to, I, you know, that's a bad turn, you gotta add this on top. If, if, and the other thing I recommend is, I don't care if you're a screenwriter or not, write one script. Just write one script. You can come up with an idea and you can force yourself to sit in that seat until you have 110 pages. And that exercise will blow your mind because, first of all, it will give you incredible empathy for any single writer. <laughs> and second of all, it will give you incredible confidence as a writer because guess what? We all write. This is a skill that we all have. Some people just exercise it more than others. So an IP, intellectual property, is the main game. As a producer, you really don't see residuals. You only see residuals as a writer or a director, so you better try to do that. Um, and um, I forgot again. What were you saying? <laughs> I was wondering how much it changed from. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It does. It changes. You know, it just depends on how ready it is. Sometimes I see scripts and it's not as on the page like Hustle and Flow. When that dialogue starts, man ain't like a dog. You're like, <laughs> oh shit, this is good. You know, from the get go. Yeah. Same thing. Same thing with boys. It, it just, it, it. You know that. But then other things you read, like when I read 42.4 percent, which was what something new was called. I was like, this is such a good idea. This is so relevant. You know, inter interracial dating is so happening. People aren't you know, exploring what it means, you know, from a black female perspective. What does that mean, you know? It was always the black guys with the white girls. Like, that was what we'd seen a lot of. So I really wanted to explore that, uh, having lived it, and I, I felt that um, that script could get there, but it wasn't there. We had to hire some writers to come in, you know, smooth it out. I hired two different women who came in, smoothed it out. It was all good. They didn't do more than 50% of the of, of changes, so the original writer kept, you know, her sole credit. But um, yeah, so you just yeah, so it does change, you know. I mean, look, if we could all just find drop dead great scripts like lying around, <laughs> life would be a lot easier. But um, but that's where you develop your skills as a developer, you know. And I, and I say that. I say that only to say that development is depth, okay? Because of most of Hollywood runs on people who get paid to talk about making movies. They talk about reading the scripts, they talk about you know who should be attached and what actors and this and that, and it never happens. <laughs> That's why, I mean, I couldn't, I, the studio thing was like, oh my God, there's so many scripts and there's just all, you're mired in development. You're mired in having these conversations about movies that you know will never get made and it's only because it's commerce. People are getting paid to do it. And it is, it's, that's why I was like, oh, I gotta just go find some money and just start making movies because I can't develop anymore. But, but the good development, which is, oh, this is a good idea. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work on it a little bit to make it better so I can make it is good. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, in Hustle and Flow, mm -hmm. um, not only what he's saying in that car, but the way it's filmed, mm -hmm. where you slowly kind of reveal mm -hmm. where he is mm -hmm. and what the mm -hmm. situation mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. and then the drive in that car mm -hmm. and that wheel and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. So when you said that one of the movies you watched was uh, Taxi, Taxi Driver, Driver. Mm -hmm. my question is, because when I look at it, I say, boy, that director got it. 
he just got it visually. It was just so exciting and sexy and so on and so forth. And the question is, was that style developed a little bit between you guys sitting and watching and doing, or is it something that he... No, it's completely developed. It was completely developed because the one thing is that we had a lot of time between the time I read the script and the time we shot the movie. So I put him with Amy Vincent, who I went to college with, and you know, all this is also relationships, like hang on to the good ones, right? So I gave it to Amy, who had shot Eve's Bayou and some other beautiful things, and, and they got together, and so they had literally like three years to sort of board it and think about it and go to Memphis and take pictures and look at the locations and come back <laughs> and reboard it and think about it. And so, and then watch movies. We would, we would go over to Singleton, we used to have the spot over in Lamert Park, and, and we would sit there and we would watch movies that, that, that Craig thought was inspired by, you know, mm -hmm. and um, so the rich colors of Taxi Driver, that's the same thing that you see, you know, you, you sort of think of a palette, like what is the best palette, and this is all, this is all, you know, pre-prep work that um, is essential, I think, especially for a first-time director to really know what you're doing so that when you call action on the first day, it's like, it's like those, those, I think of it like the Olympic athletes who just go, oh, oh, you know, you see them and they're like going down the chute in their mind, you know? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that's, that's what we did for years. We were like going through, yeah, okay, we're gonna do that. And then, then we got there and we we're like, okay, it's on. And, that, and everybody knew, you know, because then shit happens. Then, you know, a horrible freak storm came in and shut everything down for a day, you know? Anthony got, I won't even go into it. Yeah. Um, but, but stuff happens, and so you have to um, be so prepared that when things go wrong, it's not, you're not that far off the mark. I wanted to ask you a question. You mentioned earlier that uh, Terrence didn't want to rap. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to know, can you describe for me the recording process of the songs and in, uh, in accordance with the schedule of the production, like which yeah, came yeah, yeah. First. Okay, so when we knew we were gonna make it, and John was like, "We're gonna do it. We're gonna do it." We sent Terry down. We, we you know, we got um, Three Six Mafia and um, Al Capone. He's the guy in the white. Um, and um, we sent Terrence down by himself to hang out with these guys. It was so funny. <laughs> Because he was scared. <laughs> he was so scared. And um, he was like, I got kids. You know what I'm saying? I got kids. And I was like, look, I think they're OK. Because I didn't know them, you know? Um, don't worry, you're good. Because uh, Juicy had him, and Al had him. They all had him. But you know, they're, real, they're the real deal. I mean, they're the real deal. So basically, um, then we joined them. We all came down maybe like a few days later and we went into this recording studio in Memphis. And, um, you know, the, this is actually, I'll back it up. So we knew we were making the movie. We knew we had to record like four, five tracks for the movie. Craig always knew that he wanted to spit something live and that was what that trick. But the other stuff was pre-recorded, right? So um, we, uh, it, it, I mean, what was, then the reason that movie won the Oscar for best song is because the music was so integrated into, into the fabric of the movie and you actually got to see them build hard, hard out here for a pimp. So Juicy and Al had written all the stuff, put some beats to it. They sent, you know, they sent it to Terrence so he could learn it. Then we all went down there and just literally one night we went to the studio. Oh my God, there was so much smoke going on. And we <laughs> recorded all the tracks, and then we had the tracks. And then um, everybody, you know, just learned them, you know, so that when you're doing playback on set, you, you're so in it that you know, you know, how to, how to lip sync it properly. And, um, and that's what we did. Yeah. Got it. Thank yeah. you. And we did, and we got really cheap masters because we were like, "Look, we don't have any money. It's a very low budget movie. 
So give us your bottom, bottom line thing. And then they read the script and they came up with, you know, because in the script, the crazy thing about the script is there's no lyrics in the script. There's, you know, so you're reading the script, but you're hearing the lyrics. It's kind of crazy. That's how good it was. That's how good the script was. But the, um, but so then he would read DJ Scratches out a lyric, you know, and then, so those guys, brilliant writer, rappers that they are, just came in and, you know, threw it down. Very cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Hello. How are you? Well, thanks. Okay. My question, or my second question, is: by the time uh, Hustle and Flow hit Sundance, it was like so. It was legendary. There was so much buzz around it that I heard a legend that somebody bid a hundred million dollars on it without seeing it. Yeah, that's a legend. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, but you know, we would have took that hundred million. Yeah. Let me tell you. So my question is, how did you generate enough buzz to uh, go from a movie that you had trouble getting produced to one that everybody want, that was there wanting it I'll before tell you. seeing it? I'll tell you. We had secret screenings. That's what we did. We invited like certain people, taste makers. Uh, we went to Lorenzo's house. This is, this is like you use your thing. So we went to Lorenzo's house and we screened it. Um, he for, was an executive. Yeah, yeah, he produces now the big uh, Transformers and yes. G.I. Joe and all those big things. Um, we, we showed it to uh, a couple, a couple, we had like two or three screenings and like everybody wanted to get in and I guess the buzz, I don't know, did we create the buzz? I don't really know. Like, I think everybody totally knew about the movie because as I said, I'd saturated the community with it multiple times. So everybody knew, oh, that movie finally got made. Yeah, that movie finally got made. I wonder how it is. Because the truth is, people love the script. They just didn't want to pay for it. They just didn't want to make it, you know? So um, I think that's, that's what it was. It was just a couple screenings, then people couldn't get in, we cut it off, it was like, no. And then, uh, and then when we got there, um, that first screening just sort of blew it wide open. It was electric. It was yeah. every scene. I mean, it was the craziest audience because every single scene was met with, he, what? You know. Um, yeah. Still. But you know, buzz is something you can't really control. It's just like going viral now. You can't control that. It either does or it doesn't. You know, it either has that sort of. Je ne sais quoi or doesn't, you know? I guess it did. It still does, by the way. It still does. It still does. Just I think I just decided tonight I'm gonna do the tenth anniversary at the at the film festival this year. Um and and, and reunite the cast. So you guys should all come. So we're probably done, right? <laughs> Thank you guys. Do good work. Thank you. So, so here's the thing, right? She's still a producer. She's the director of the Los Angeles Film Festival. She is on the board of director of Film Independent. She's the board of director of Women in Film. She is an Academy member. She has three kids and she found time to come here. I don't get it.